uh, you, you don't have the emails of the uh, Thai community or anyone who wishes to have it. Uh, uh, for everyone who is listening, uh, we have a group of uh, eight students, uh, undergraduates at Northeastern, uh, who have been working with me to prepare case studies and briefs for each of the countries that we are discussing. And um, we wish these uh, uh, documents to be the background and guess which we can have meaningful conversations uh, on each country. But we also want this as a means of getting feedback from all of you so that we can uh, integrate your thoughts and your comments and, and then try to get it published either independently or as a synthetic report that we will prepare at the end of the year. So this is an initiative that uh, effectively brings together the alumni office, faculty and staff, undergraduate students, and uh, members of our communities around the world. And we have designed this series to be also open for anyone outside the Northeastern community here or uh, internationally. Uh, it is entirely open for everyone to participate. I know that um, a number of serious audit, uh, 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 Supreme Audit institutions uh, have expressed interest in that as a lot of money is being expended trying to support the economy and deal with the health crisis. And uh, that raises a lot of management, uh, integrity, uh, waste and fraud uh, issues. So we do wish uh, this to be a point of uh, concentration to see how uh, different government agencies and institutions are trying to ensure there is integrity and fairness in the way that uh, the resources are, are, are made uh, are available. So when we have uh, the Thai representative join us, I hope that we will be able to hear from, uh, from him as well. Um, in the meantime, let me just uh, from the very beginning, uh, thank our students who are uh, uh, assisting in this uh, effort, and I will mention them alphabetically. Thank you to Drew Baldwin, Joe Dangram, Anthony Dos Santos, Catherine Dris Dr uh, Driscoll, Linda Manciaris, Sabrina Jean Munoz, uh, Stella Milonakis, and Terena Fan. So uh, some of you are already here. Thank you guys now officially also for your contribution to this uh, 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 initiative. So uh, Yelena, we can start now. It is um, a five minutes past. So greetings from Boston, everyone. Welcome to our first Thailand community virtual program and our first of the series COVID-19 and the new world order. On behalf of Northeastern University and myself, I hope you and your family are staying safe and healthy during this turbulent time. As an institution, we are putting uh, our resources into helping to find a cure for COVID-19 disease. We have faculty who are focusing their efforts on mapping the strain of the disease, preparing the next generation of highly skilled, versatile, and enterprise and healthcare leaders, uh, leaders, educating the public about COVID-19, supply chain, community resilience and response. I'm sure we all realize now how important community is and it's wonderful to see so many of you here with us today. Before we proceed to the official program, I would like to make a few announcements. First of all, to make the program run smoothly, please remain muted during the event and keep your audio, uh, video off. We are taking the attendance, so if you please rename your profile name with your full name, or if you cannot, don't know how to do that, just type it in a, a chat box. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, type them in the chat box by clicking on the chat button uh, on the below in the toolbar in the Zoom platform. Uh, and now please save a couple of dates. As I said uh, earlier, this is our first session uh, uh, of the series. We're starting with Thailand and we're following up with Brazil on June 9th and India on June 18th. I would like to invite a new member of our Thailand community, uh, Serena Sachet, uh, for her, her welcome remarks. 
Serena? Yes. Thank you, Yelena, for supporting the event. Uh, as Yelena mentioned, I'm Serena, and I graduated from the DeMore McKim School of Business, class of 2019. I'm a part of Northeastern University's Thailand Community Lead Team, and the Community Lead Team works together to keep Northeastern alumni, both at the graduate and undergraduate levels, engaged mainly through hosting small gatherings and professional events. And although I joined the team very recently, I've been able to engage with other alumni members, network, and also hear more about what they do, which is obviously the most exciting part. And I wanted to take a moment to thank all of you for attending the event as well. The ongoing pandemic has definitely created an impact in all of our lives as we also try to adapt to the new normal. Before I pass the mic back to Yelena, I wanted to thank you, our speakers, Colin, Professor Nikos, and Susie, for their time to share their perspective, and I hope we all have a great discussion. Oh, thank you so much for your warm words, uh, Serena. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to Professor Nikos Passes. Uh, for many of you, Dr. Passes is not a stranger. We came together to Bam Bangkok a couple of years ago, right? With a program on uh, government correction, corruption. Uh, Dr. Passes is a professor of criminology and criminal justice at Northeastern University and co-director of Institute for Security and Public uh, Policy. He's uh, also a visiting professor at the Basel Institute of Gov on Governments a visiting professor at Vienna University of Applied Science for Management and Communication Center for Corporate Governance and Business Ethics, distinguished visiting professor at Beijing Normal University, professor distinguished practitioner in financial integrity and senior fellow of the Financial Integrity Institute at Case Western Reserve Law School head of UN sanctions implementation legal review services at compliance capacity and skills international CCSI and chair of the academic council of the anti-corruption academy in India. Dr. Passas received a 2017 Dr. Jean Mayer's global uh, citizenship award from uh, Tufts University Institute on Global Leadership. Without further ado, Professor Nikos Passos, please welcome. Well, Yelena, thank you very much. Thank you very much to the speakers and all of you for joining us. I would like to make some introductory remarks to place the whole uh, series and our conversation today in the broader context. We're all dealing with a pandemic crisis right now, but uh, the first point I would like to make is that crisis of all kinds and their effects are far less random than they may appear at first. Actions or inactions by decision makers cause or contribute to crisis by worsening or alleviating uh, their effects. So uh, some argue that disasters uh, are, are, are at times welcome and taking advantage of for political or business agendas Others suggest that uh, a crisis is a label, a claim of urgency that is used by leaders in order to define uh, certain conditions and environments in which uh, assertions of power and promotion of interest take place. So these are points of contention. There are tensions and controversies that we have seen also currently regarding where the, the origin of the virus, the responsibility of different governments, the need to focus on national priorities or alternatively on global coordination and collaboration. And some of the measures that are being introduced can have very lasting consequences. Measures and, 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 and uh, policies acquire a life of their own and vested interests grow roots. And we have seen examples of that with many responses to the 9-11 attacks. So as the disease has reached every corner of this planet, everyone is responding in a different way. And this pandemic is testing the quality of governance at the local, regional, and international level. And I would like to explain in a, a couple of uh, sentences what governance actually means. We're talking about a set of laws principles, rules, processes, and programs 
that aim at framing and promoting the goals, demands, and policies of different social actors and the influence everyone's expectations, interactions, and resolve conflicts in local, national, and world affairs. So we're talking about a normative and institutional framework with a guiding power or legitimacy to address problems through interactions between government agencies, political parties, businesses, academia, civil society, and one country with another. So the pandemic now is revealing and exacerbating some problems while at the same time providing opportunities for fresh starts and reforms. It makes clear uh, what leaders, uh, uh, with the quality of leadership also, foresight or negligence. It exposes fraud and corruption. It produces examples also of compassionate and effective leadership. We have, on the one hand, some nonsensical and self-serving willful blindness examples, which are juxtaposed by wisdom, caring, and genuine pursuit of the common good, uh, which people were elected and appointed to serve. So this is an opportunity to engage in a comparative look at the quality of governance in different societies while collect connecting with our uh, community. And this is at three different uh, uh, levels. The one is the preparedness. Uh, how good and equitable the healthcare system, for example, was before the crisis. How laws and regulation incentivized preparedness in medicine, equipment, infrastructure, and so on. It was a report actually just yes, uh, uh, this week that, was, uh, that appeared where a, uh, a public-private partnership in Europe uh, was supposed to promote research through very substantial funding in areas that are otherwise neglected and serve the public interest in health. And as it turned out, there was strong opposition and blockage of pandemic preparedness as recent as 2018. So what we did before is an indication of uh, the quality or a, or, a, or a yardstick for this quality of governance that we're talking about. The second level is the response once the pandemic hit. We have seen denial, we have seen neglect, we have seen anti-scientist uh, trends. On the other side, we have seen lockdowns, government interventions in markets, all kinds of responses. And then the question is, prospectively, what do we expect uh, when the risks and the challenges that are on the hor horizon will have to be uh, dealt with, as a lot of the measures and reforms will have long-term consequences. And I can mention as examples, the surveillance technologies, uh, the uh, emergency powers, the extraordinary debt that it is uh, we entered into this crisis with record levels of debt among governments, private sector and household internationally. That is being uh, increased dramatically after the crisis started. We have seen inequalities exacerbated. We have seen power grabs, fraud and criminal enterprises, overt use of invasive apps, extraordinary unemployment and economic downturn. Even though at the same time, financial markets are entirely divorced from the economic reality on the ground. We have 41 million unemployed officially recorded in the United States when the markets are, uh, some indices are actually at a record level despite what is going on, which reflects to a large extent government interventions and, uh, uh, and responses. So COVID-19 brings old and new challenges together on a global scale at the same time. And it is, there is a risk of a perfect storm with economic downturn, huge debt, and strain on governments, business, and people. There are many parallels 
and lessons that we learned from past emergencies. And we have seen rule of law breakdowns, security problems, corruption and serious crimes of different types. And indicatively, I want to mention the tsunamis that we have seen in Southeast Asia and South Asia. The earthquakes in Pakistan, in Haiti, and in Mexico, floods and hurricanes, such as Katrina here in the United States, famine and conflict in Somalia and other parts of Africa, wars and reconstruction efforts in Iraq, Afghanistan, embargo and sanctions regimes from old ones in South Africa and Israel to more recent ones on Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. What is common under these is lessons about how society and governments interact, the role of business, and what opportunities for misconduct are created by emergency situations, what motives are produced for people to take advantage of them, and how controls may actually be weakened uh, as, a as a result of attention to speed and expediency and, and uh, uh, the need to address the needs of ordinary people. And then finally, we have deglobalization risks, where trade is likely to shrink, Export bans, uh, have, uh, we have seen movement restrictions, trends of nationalisms and populisms. We have seen more ad hoc crisis management rather than principle-based strategic planning. We have seen lobbying from inefficient industries conducive to favoritism, interference in markets, sometimes against the broad public interest, big firms becoming more uh, dominant, government getting growing, uh, more graft in oligarchic contexts, new rules and regulations, hence higher cost of compliance, all this potentially leading to lower productivity, economic slowdown, increasing debt, potential for supply chain and food disruptions, and social unrest. So all this is uh, uh, combined with what I have called uh, uh, crime producing asymmetries in law, economy and politics, as well as technology and power. Stress on governments, reducing capacity, pressures on companies to survive or make some profit. Uh, motives to turn to corrupt practices as a solution. Vulnerability of big spending programs to abuse fraud and mismanagement demand and supply asymmetries, potentially austerity measures, and a weaker guiding power and effectiveness of international norms and institutions, potential conflicts, and long-term geopolitical changes. So the question is, how effective will be the policy responses to address these concerns and manage the risks? In some countries, trust in government has been enhanced. In others, we see turmoil, chaos, protests, and general unrest. It is a challenge not just for governments, but also business, civil society, donors, and international organizations, academics, and each of us individual, with a role and responsibility to contribute to not merely manage the crisis, but engage in positive social change. Resilience is a word we hear a lot, we can understand it as the capacity to absorb disturbance and maintain integrity. But should we see it as a preservation of the status quo and seek a return to some sort of old normality or as the capacity to create a new and better world for our children and grandchildren? I would like to uh, finish with a quote from uh, Financial Times um, uh, op-ed piece published by India writer Arundhati Roy. She writes, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, 
our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. So this is the beginning of a journey we start here uh, to compare the context and perspectives of different countries. We want to learn lessons from problem actions as well as outstanding leadership, good and innovative ways of dealing with these problems. We start our journey with Thailand uh, and we thank uh, Susie Nam and, uh, and Colin uh, who are, whom are, I will introduce one by one and will take the floor next. Let us start with uh, Susie Nam who is a, contributed ed a contributing editor to Forbes magazine and has also written guidebooks about Thailand and Bangkok. She has written widely in prestigious publications in North America, Europe, and Asia. And she has a bachelor's degree uh, in political science from Northeastern, a JD from Boston College, and a master's from Columbia's School of Journalism. So Susie, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, so as a journalist, I thought it was um, important as we had this bigger picture discussion to lay down some of the facts on the ground in Thailand um, to give some context to the discussion that we're going to be having. Um, and I premise that by saying that in some ways, the Thai experience um, with coronavirus has actually been pretty extraordinary. So Thailand was the first country outside of China with a confirmed case. And this happened all the way um, in early, mid-January. At that point, um, there had always been a lot of travelers coming from China to um, Thailand, for mostly for tourism purposes, but other purposes as well. Um, so it wasn't actually that surprising um, that it happened here. But what unfolds later into today has been a little bit surprising. So, from that first case, um, we saw here cases continue to rise until around the middle of March. So over the course of a couple of months. And daily cases at that point peaked at around 188 cases, never more than that. Um, later that month, Prime Minister Paiut Chan Ocha declared a state of emergency and about a week later, a curfew was put in place. Uh, as happened in most countries around the globe, many non-essential places closed, including shopping malls, sit-down restaurants, um, hair salons, public parks were closed, schools were closed. In fact, they closed before lots of, um, lots of other things happened. And though the government at the time was criticized by some for acting a little bit too slowly, when we look in retrospect, we, we see that, you know, Thailand, the government's response was actually pretty middle of the road. Um, they, they weren't the first country to close things down, but certainly were not in the, you know, the, the later group to close things down. Um, as for incoming international travel, the Thai government announced some travel restrictions and quarantine requirements in early March, actually late February to early March. Um, but by late March, Thailand had de facto closed its borders with some very limited exceptions. There's a mandatory right now 14 day quarantine in a government facility or government approved facility for anyone entering the country. Um, and right now, the only people coming in from other countries really are just repatriating Thai citizens. Um, and as I said, um, they are required to go through a 14 day quarantine. It, in the beginning, as other countries are still doing, it was a mandatory at home quarantine, but I think pretty quickly the Thai government realized that that wasn't the most effective way to stop the spread of the disease. So now people are either going to government facilities or government approved facilities. And it's, a you know, having seen the videos and talked to people who've been through this experience, you know, it's pretty, it's, uh, it's pretty strict. Um, so fortunately for Thailand, though, cases have continued to decline since that peak, which was 188 cases. As of today, there have only been 3,083 confirmed cases and 58 deaths. And in the past couple of weeks, nearly all of the new cases have been repatriating ties in quarantine facilities, 
those folks are required to go through testing at least twice, once when they enter and once when they leave. Um, and in numerous cases, they have been the ones who have been basically bringing back the disease. Um, now, one of the things that we hear a lot is, well, oh, you know, Thailand must not be testing that many people if they have that few cases. And, you know, this is in some ways a valid criticism. The testing rate in Thailand is on the low side. So when you look at the, the data, it's about six tests per thousand people. Compared to other countries around the globe, though, that puts it a, right about in the middle. Um, and for context, countries like Malaysia, Greece, and Korea have a testing rate that's about three times of what Thailand's rate is. Germany, Germany, Switzerland, Canada are testing at about eight times that rate. US just about nine times Thailand's rate. And But whether or not all of the cases are being captured on the books, what is very clear is that the healthcare system hasn't been overwhelmed. We aren't seeing people dying in droves of unreported or unrecorded illnesses. We aren't seeing major spikes in just the number of deaths overall over the past few months. So of course, in any country, we can say that the official numbers aren't gonna really reflect what's going on because of many different factors. We do know that in Thailand, um, they must be reflective of some, some truth. And because of this, though the borders remain closed for indefinitely, Thailand has just moved to the, what they are calling the third phase of reopening the economy. Um, shopping malls have reopened, fitness centers, movie theaters, public beaches are open, public parks, restaurants, um, restrictions have been reduced. Serving alcohol, interestingly enough, is still not allowed in public. Um, you can buy alcohol, you cannot consume it outside. Um, for, and I guess the justification for that was that when people drink, they just lose their judgment and tend to interact socially in unsafe ways. The curfew remains in place, but the hours have been, um, continue to get smaller and smaller. Schools remain closed, but that may change soon. In daily life, people are required to wear masks in public places. They're required to observe physical distancing. When you enter stores, parks, and other establishments, you either need to sign in, which you can do on a piece of paper, you write your phone number down, or you can use an app. And there, you know, there is a choice. You don't, you definitely do not need to use your smartphone and download the QR code. You can do it physically. So in sum, when you look at the bigger picture of what's going on in Thailand, um, it has been a truly an extraordinary experience compared to what's going on in, um, in other countries. It's certainly not clear what the factors are that have contributed to the low rates of transmission and just the low rates of disease overall, but it is becoming clearer and clearer that, um, that it's just a different experience. As I said all of the almost all of the cases in the last maybe 10 days have been cases that are what they're referring to as imported cases they are just not seeing really any cases circulating around in the community and again there are probably are cases that are circulating around in the community but there are not so many that we're seeing many people coming to hospitals and being sick um, what will be interesting is you know, one of the things that Nico was talking about, um, about the economic stimuli and the bailouts that are happening. And as money is poured into these programs, because the economy certainly has suffered significantly, it will be interesting to see how well um, Thailand can weather that storm and if they will be able to be an extraordinary country in that regard or, or not. Um, so that's the, that's the context for you. And I will pass the floor back to Nikos. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Susie. Uh, we will get into uh, questions and uh, audience participation afterwards. Uh, let me just introduce Kulvek or calling Janvata Navid, a good friend from, uh, um, uh, for a long, long, long time. We have met both in Bangkok and in the United States. He's the CEO of the Thai Institute of Directors, and he used to be the principal project uh, advisor to Thailand's private sector collective action coalition against corruption. I must say here that I am uh, uh, thrilled 
to have Colin here because this initiative is the best global example of an anti-corruption initiative that Thailand uh, practically leads the world. They have more than a thousand companies on their own coming together, uh, enforcing uh, a self-governance uh, framework and introducing a certification program that looks at outcomes and not just outputs. So that is a shining example of how the private sector can lead the way even uh, without participation or contribution from the government. Uh, Colin was also an independent director and member of the audit committee at Thai Poly Acrylic and a partner and advisor at PricewaterhouseCoopers in Bangkok. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Chulalongkorn University, an MBA in Finance and International Business from Sassen Graduate Institute of Business Administration, and a Master of Science in Real Estate Development from MIT. Colin, you have the floor. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, yes, we can. can. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Nikos, for that beautiful introduction. And um, um, thanks for, to Susan for, for the introduction to uh, Thailand. And uh, thanks for giving this opportunity for me to reflect on something about Thailand. We can't learn from Thailand because we have to learn from each other. Thailand has to learn from others also. But what's interesting is uh, I would try to link governance, uh, fighting COVID and anti-corruption together. <laughs> it sounds strange, but uh, I'm going to do it. Uh, like Susan said, uh, the, uh, the uh, COVID in Thailand, uh, I think that uh, what Thailand has achieved so far is quite impressive, not because I'm Thai, but uh, look at the number and uh, I think it has been done quite well. Um, if we look at the heart of governance, governance like uh, Professor uh, Pasa who said that governance is about people and government. Together, we call collective leadership. Collective leadership. In Thailand, um, and any place in the world also, governance consists of three pillars. The first one is people, is individual, um, is individual uh, practice. The second one is social sanction. The third one is the action from the government, right? Uh, on COVID, um, I can see that the first one, the individual and our discipline. In Thailand, we are so disciplined and uh, we wear masks every, every day, uh, all the time. We wash our hands and everything. Um, we watch TVs and everything on TV is all about COVID because the government tried to communicate about this uh, heavily. On the social sanction, social pressure, Everyone talks about COVID, uh, the social media and everything. And um, we, we even, uh, if someone does, uh, does not uh, follow the regulations, we would have social sanction on them. On the government side, it's interesting that they, like Susan said, they come up with the, uh, the quarantine guideline, the, uh, um, the curfew. But what struck me is that how come uh, governance on COVID is better than governance on anti-corruption? Uh, Nikos, you said that, and thank you for saying that uh, our project in Thailand is, 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 uh, is shining, but actually Thailand still rank as uh, one of the worst place for corruption is still ranked by Transparency International as number one, two, one, zero, one hundred out of the whole countries. So what's going on? 
how come people in Thailand didn't fight corruption as they effectively fight COVID? And this is something that I would like to discuss with you and hear from your thoughts also. Is culture readiness a silent gravity on governance? Culture readiness. And in Thailand, anyone who has traveled to Thailand knows that we have hospitality. Thai culture, we, uh, the hotel here is we serve really well. So why Thai people, they are, we are unique in the sense that we care so much. We care for a well-being of, uh, of others. We care for well-being from, uh, of the tourists. We care of well-being of each other. So COVID kind of attack the well-being of one another. So we fight with it together. We help each other. So I have no doubt that uh, when Thailand come, come back again, and by the way, we have suffered a lot because our GDP, uh, tourism is about 18% of our GDP. So no, no tourists right now, it's gone. But when, we, when our uh, country open again, I'm sure that healthcare would be a uh, cutting edge of Thailand. But coming back to this, Maybe is it because Thailand and our culture, our inner value is about caring for well-being. And corruption is difficult to link corruption with the well-being of the people. So we don't fight that uh, uh, as proactive as we fight a uh, uh, pandemic. Not only pandemic, you can see that in the past, when there are threat or there are challenge about well-being, for example, the tsunami, or if some, anyone remember, there is an incident about Tam Luong, Tam Luong in the north of Thailand, where eight, eight, uh, 13 boys got lost in the tunnel, and then they had to be rescued, and it was next to impossible to do it, and we could get them out safely. It sounds like all the miracle that is happening on governance in Thailand has something to do with well-being. So coming to this, like um, I just start reflecting like in Hong Kong, uh, there used to be a lot of corruptions maybe 40, 50 years ago. Right now, there's, uh, uh, the, they are so impressive about fighting corruption. How come the culture in Hong Kong allow people and the government to work together to fight corruption? I think this is an interesting ex um, learning experience so that we can see if culture readiness of each country plays anything to do with the governance or the, uh, the, so, uh, uh, the problem on governance and how can we solve that governance problem at, by, by addressing this culture. So this is uh, something that I, I, I want to throw to, to, to you also. So um, before I go on, um, is there any comment on this? I do not see any, any, any questions. So uh, you, can, you, can, you can conclude and then we, we see if we can uh, have anyone uh, please, uh, everyone, feel free to submit your questions through the chat box. Yeah. So, so my I think that my question is is uh, about what culture has to do with the form of the governance of each country. I guess that's that's my point. So let me introduce a little bit about CAC, as uh, uh, Professor uh, Passas uh, has talked about. Uh, CAC, uh, as uh, Professor Passa said, is uh, the name. The full name is Collective Action Against Corruption, and uh, we have been set up ten years ago out of anger <laughs> uh, because corruption was such a uh, it damaged our society so much, and uh, 
we need to do something. And uh, the business people got together, a few of us got together and said that, hey, we can't wait for the public sector to do anything. We are a part of the equation, demand and supply. So we are the one who supply the bribe to the public sector. So from then, uh, we look at the, uh, the case of collective action all around the world. And we learned that most of them fail because it's just gathering uh, CEO together or chairman together, taking photos and then disappear. And there's no follow up. So in C for CAC, we realized that in order to make it happen, we need accountability from the private sector. To use the analogy, corruption is like, uh, is like evil and evil want to hide in the dark. So to use that analogy, we put up the spotlight and we ask the companies who are ready to say that we, we no longer want to pay bribe to be in this spotlight. If you can gather them as much as you can, more and more, then society will look at the company who are still in the shade and ask what's wrong with you. So coming back to, uh, to, the, uh, to the three pillars of governance, we start with the uh, individual discipline of organizations and then make them the social power and get them to work with the government to change the way public sector work. So that's the whole thing. It's, it's the same thing as uh, fighting COVID. It's, it's, it's the same methodology. Um, we, so uh, right now, as uh, Professor Nicole said, uh, we have about more than 1,000 companies joining us. And 400 companies out of that has pledged that they uh, have certified themselves. We have our own ISO on anti-corruption. But that's not enough. We went and interviewed each one of them how they paid the bribe in the past. And in their, in their business process, for example, if there are land development, we found out that there are 26 process that they could pay bribe. And we brainstormed with them how to stop that. So for example, it might be that they pay bribe because they want to speed up the, 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 permis uh, the permission. So, uh, the way to stop that, uh, that is to automate the permission from the public sector side. So we went to the public sector and submit the solution. And they're still quiet on that. But the more we do this, and one day with this COVID, coming back to this COVID, we hope that this COVID is going to uh, force the government to automate things. Once they automate the process, they could use our uh, solutions that we uh, brainstormed with the private sectors as a part of that automation. So, you know, the whole thing is how can we uh, minimize the, uh, the chance of, uh, of, uh, of uh, private sector to pay bribe in order to speed the process. So that is uh, the, uh, the nutshell of what we're doing as collective actions uh, on uh, anti-corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, Susie, would you like to actually respond to uh, the, the question that Colin raised on the, on the culture issue on um, uh, how is it I mean, to me, it is actually a very really interesting uh, region to look at because uh, in, in, in your part of the world, we have a lot of uh, empirical paradoxes. We have economic models where you have growth with corruption, whereas a lot of arguments are that if you have uh, a corrupt societies, uh, development is undermined. 
and um, uh, take a look at uh, some of the societies that are, you know, South Korea and so on, where corruption levels have been uh, very high, but economic growth quite substantial. Then there are the examples of Hong Kong and Singapore and how effective in anti-corruption they were. You have the example of the anti-corruption uh, uh, initiative, and yet uh, you are 101st out of 198 countries, according to uh, the Transparency International. Let me just share with everyone here the index of public integrity that the Hardy School of Governance uh, uh, publishes. And, and here what you see is different metrics that are more uh, objective. You look at judicial in in independence, and here Thailand is 47th out of 117 countries. Um, uh, administrative burden, uh, very good uh, score, 41. Uh, trade openness, ninth, extremely, uh, um, uh, 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 so 51st there. Budget transparency, e-citizenship, uh, e-citizenship is very strong. And freedom of press is the area that is lagging very substantially. So you can see that here, uh, here is the country score where Thailand is consistently above the world average, above similar um, economic development in other countries and also regionally. And the one area where there is uh, um, um, room for improvement, I'd say, is in the uh, freedom of uh, uh, press. So. Um, uh, Paul, I saw also uh, um, made uh, the comment in the chat room that uh, culture is key. Uh, Susie, do you have any further thoughts on what is so different about culture in, uh, in, in Thailand so that corruption is at high levels still by all kinds of metrics? And yet the country was able to uh, weather the storm and care for each other when it mattered. Um, I think just, you know, getting back to Colin's point about how culture is, is kind of everything and how people don't act collectively unless they view that there's some collective benefit. Um, one thing you'll notice here, which really shocked me coming from the U.S., is that there is petty corruption everywhere. And it can be kind of petty corruption that really like gets to the heart of something like, oh, you don't have to take this important driving test if you pay. And it can be petty corruption that is just about like greasing wheels, like an extra 20 baht to the parking lot attendant and your car gets preference. But it's, it, it's endemic and people are just used to behaving this way. They also see benefit in it, I think. So even people who I know who are truly, you know, believers in, in rule of law and don't, you know, will say they don't like corruption will still engage in random petty corruption. And it's just amazing. You know, they will, they want to park their car in a certain neighborhood and you're not allowed to, and they'll say, oh, no, no, don't worry. I'll just give the, the, you know, whoever a hundred baht and it should be totally fine. So in some ways, I think people may understand intrinsically that when you stamp out all corruption, you stamp all of it out. And that means that these small benefits that everybody gets from it or that they perceive that they get, those would be gone too. Because if you really said, if you really truly wanted to get rid of corruption, then you'd have to park in the same spot that everyone else had to, or, you know, you might not get some, you might not get a chance to get ahead a little bit. Uh, so I think in some ways that, well, in one way, and I, again, I'd be really interested to hear Colin's um, view on this, but I think there is a, an interior conflict that people have, which is to say, I don't like real true corruption that ruins the rule of law, but I do like these small conveniences that I'm able to take advantage of. Uh, we have also a request uh, from uh, David Nardone uh, to make a comment on uh, the uh, compensation um, uh, comparing Thailand with uh, Singapore. David, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I think, I mean, I've lived in Hong Kong for a few years, a few decades ago. Uh, one of them comes down to, to the compensation that you have for civil servants. I mean, Thailand is known for having, you know, two or three times as many people in the government as maybe they need because it was a 
a good way to employ people. It's a way to pay back patronage. But yet you have this massive, you know, low compensation and the same in, in military and other disciplines. Yet those people have the same aspirations as the business people that are coming from a different background in terms of their kids and schools and, and everything. So I think this is part of what, what's happened. In, in Singapore, when they, when they raise the wages really high, then people are, you know, are being placed in you know, special programs and educated and geared that you're going to come back and you're working for one of the one of the government agencies. Although Thailand has it also, uh, but that you can make a career out of it. That it would be, you know, something where you'll have good compensation, you'll be in the right circles, this type of thing. So to me, a lot of it goes back to that. I mean, when, when Suzanne's talking about these, I, I mean, I don't park my own car anymore. But when I when I go, go to re, renew my, you know, my visa or something, well. I mean, I'm embarrassed. I'm only in there 30 minutes because my team is there in the morning, and you know they're they're sort of setting things up, and that that's how you know, how it works in Thailand. And it's more, you know, I, I guess it's convenient, but you you certainly can call it petty corruption. That you know we're used to that, and and people that are underpaid in in the civil service, uh, you know, basically have a you know a high level of service lane and then the normal lane, and and often people are going to the other lane because. It's just a way to sort of make up on that lack of compensation. So I, I think part of it come, just comes back to that. And, and people that have been in this sort of service, I don't want to say it's a way of equalizing, you know, their status, but certainly they drive nice cars and, you know, they're, they're in, a, in a much better situation than you would gather from the type of position they have, whether it's in the police, the military, or, or these various civil service branches. I think that's just part of it. If, if we had less people and we paid more, you have a better chance to work that out. There have been those initiatives mentioned on on the e-commerce. So I know like on customs is a terrible thing for the business people, particularly they had a reward system. And, you know, if, if you went into a customs dispute and you're, and you're found guilty, whether it's, you think it's correct or not, people wouldn't risk it because the penalty was four times the customs duty. And that money was split along, among the customs people. And then they would say, well, you know, it's just the law, you know, we're abiding by the law, but people are in a fear of it. And they they started to, you know, to back away from that penalty regime on being automatic. And they have e-customs, so the, actually no one ever touches the paperwork. So customs has improved dramatically because of these types of initiatives. But but it takes a, it takes a long time. And one is you you have to make these government jobs, you know, that people can actually live on them. This the same on school teachers that are doing extra tuition or you know, they have gifts from parents and such. It's just the same thing. It's just a, a lack of income and compensation to support their families. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two questions that I see coming in from the audience. Uh, let me raise both of them and let our panelists address them. The first one is, uh, what is the role uh, that tourism and hospitality play in petty corruption as well as uh, more serious corruption. That is one. And the other one is a question about how uh, governments uh, deal and address the balance between the health of the society versus the health of the economy. Uh, uh, the comment is that, you know, everybody gets stressed out having been uh, uh, restricted at home for very long with all kinds of health effects on that. And in different parts of the world, we have seen that the balancing of the economy and the broader health uh, is handled differently. So how does that promote the societal interests in, uh, in Thailand and how well that balance has been struck so far in Thailand? So if you could address those, those two questions before we, we take more. And I want to um, uh, uh, also let everyone know that uh, we are going to continue until we answer your questions and our uh, panelists are uh, kindly staying on. So we do have extra time. We're not completing at, uh, 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 on the hour, but we're gonna go um, uh, perhaps uh, 15, 20 minutes uh, or half an hour more. So Colin and Susie, please. So the, the first question is uh, tourism. Uh, what is their role on corruptions? Yes. Is that right? And yes. what kind of corruptions we're talking about? 
petty corruption or um, grander scale? Okay, okay. Uh, on the grander scale, uh, all this uh, is about. It's not about tourists pay, paying bribe, but uh, the process of uh, tourism industry, such as uh, uh, hotels that are built in a resort that are built in an exotic island, how they got the per land permission um, in the uh, in some uh, in some restricted areas. Um, those are. Uh, we can, there's many of them that are on the newspaper that they did not get the license uh, properly. So, so those are probably uh, uh, most of what I can think of as a grander scale. But petty corruption or, you know, um, in Thailand, I guess, uh, in, in terms of uh, paying for the bus to stop, the tourist bus to stop somewhere. All these, all these tiny things in order to service the tourism industry. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if someone has to pay something. Uh, Susie, you want to add on that? Sorry, I just unmuted. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. It, it wasn't clear to me from that question um, whether there was something very particular about tourism and hospitality that made it more ripe for um, corruption. It's often a cash business and, you know, the people who are participating often aren't citizens. So I think in that sense, you probably will see more, more opportunities for it. Um, and it's a substantial part of the economy. But other than that, I, I, I might have missed some of the nuance of that question, but I think it, exactly, Colin, what you said is, is what I would have said as well. Well, one thing that I could add, because I also come from a country that has managed fairly well so far the crisis and is also uh, dependent on tourism, that is Greece. <clears throat> and um, uh, the cash component is one of them, but another one is to, uh, to see how quickly one pushes the button to open up and in what way the economy. So um, how do you do uh, physical distancing in a place where you're supposed to socialize and have fun meeting others, making new friends and going with old friends and family? Um, my guess is, uh, the, 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 the connection that I see with corruption is that the risk is that some decisions may be made in haste or some decisions may be made favoring one um, type of health, the health of the economy uh, in the short term, as opposed to uh, the health of the society and the health of the economy for the longer term. Before, because if someone misjudges this and you have new outbreaks and you have to close down again, then the damage is far more serious, far more substantial and longer term. So here uh, you have to have good analysis of the context and good infrastructure and preparation to alter the way in which people engage in tourism. And, and some uh, uh, places in fact can function like if you have an open park where people can keep their distances it's not the same as the pool parties and the happy hours where you're gonna have people actually coming into very close contact with each other. Now, if there are serious stresses in large parts of the economy uh, uh, that's revolving around tourism, what that does is create much stronger pressures on people and companies to bend the rules and cut corners and do things that they wouldn't do otherwise in order uh, uh, to compete, in order to survive, in order to keep things going. So that would be, to me, that would be a red flag. If I were an, uh, a regulator or, or an auditor, I would look at where the stresses are now, what the government can do to uh, uh, relieve some of these pressures, and if they are not, to watch out for serious misconduct and also preferential treatment of some versus others and therefore an effect on um, um, competitive 
behavior and uh, uh, and the free and the free market uh, there. Uh, we have seen how um, uh, governments do it differently. In, in, in Greece, they are talking about bailouts of airlines, for example, without much in exchange. Whereas in Germany, you see that you, you, you save Lufthansa, but the government gets 20% in the company uh, in return. So um, in the United States, it's quite different so far. And there is a lot more resistance for many quarters in this because for seven years, the airline companies were using the uh, immense liquidity they had in order to buy back shares instead of preparing for something that uh, fiction and uh, scientists uh, were writing about uh, for years. I mean, this pandemic was no surprise to anyone in government and in business. There is no excuse for not being prepared now. We can come up with uh, uh, rationalizations, but they're not good enough when, uh, when people for years now have been telling us to get ready for this, right? So, um, the, uh, there is also the question, uh, there is a direct question actually on whether there are any platforms in Thailand to report anonymously corrupt practices. Uh, before that, I thought that there was a second question that we did not address yet. Yes, it's the about... balance between economy and and uh, and health of of, of uh, individuals. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, my question to myself also is that is Thailand overdoing it? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, we if our if twenty percent of our GDP almost twenty rely on tourism industry and still has to rely on tourism industry in the future. Once we open our country, we are exposed to <laughs> tourists from everywhere in the world to come into this and then uh, they might expose to us, we might expose to them. So what's the cause of that? <laughs> but, but it's a very expensive, uh, I have to say that it's a very expensive me measure uh, our national airline just filed bankruptcy. Uh, right now, if anyone wants to buy cheap resort, cheap luxury resort, you have, you can do, you have a lot of choices. So um, I would think that uh, we, it's a painful, but uh, if we have to choose between um, fighting, uh, fighting the pandemic and balancing, the economic growth, maybe the pandemic uh, is to me more, much more important. I mean, this is, this is also what a lot of uh, pandemic economists actually are saying that uh, you cannot have a healthy society if you do not have healthy individuals, uh, because it is uh, supply chain disruptions that you can then count on, uh, uh, demand destruction, and, um, and uh, also reputational risk. If you, if you develop a reputation that uh, you do not pay sufficient attention to humans and their health, um, then people go elsewhere to, to have their uh, vacation, right? Um, Susie, did you have any comments, any thoughts? Um, just to add to the, the um, comments about tourism, you know, in some ways, Thailand has shown a remarkable amount of restraint in basically cutting off 20% of the economy without blinking, really, you know, when you think about it. And there certainly are a lot of interests here who have a huge economic interest in getting tourism restarted again. So I know the country is focusing right now on domestic tourism, and there are lots of really interesting ideas to, to make that happen. But, you know, that like there are no international flights coming into this country. And looking at, you know, comparing it to what's going on in the U.S., where, like, still you can fly in and out here, like, you literally just cannot get a flight to come into Thailand. And if you were by chance able to, you'd sit in a government facility for 14 days before you could go, go anywhere else. And, of course, that, that in part is because there's a pretty strong government right now that has the ability to make decisions like that. Um, but again, it is remarkable to like, compare it to, I think it's Cyprus just a couple of days ago announced that they're open for tourism 
And they, are, they have this amazing program where if you happen to catch the coronavirus while you're on vacation there, they'll pay for everything. They'll pay for your medical care, your treatment, et cetera. <laughs> So, right, and, and you could see how, you know, given how important it is to someone's economy, how they may go that route. But, you know, you compare it to Thailand, who's just basically said, just give us some time. And I think it's something, again, that's pretty remarkable and frankly impressive that they've been able to pull it off, regardless of the fact that there are so many vested interests right now who want to see the country open up because that's how they make their money. Uh, we have two more questions. Um, uh, the one is, if there is a platform to anonymously report corrupt practices, that is a quick one, uh, if, uh, uh, if, if uh, you guys know the answer to that. And the other one is an interesting um, comparison between uh, Thailand and the USA or Brazil, where uh, we have uh, the spreading of misinformation and fake news that affect the behavior of people that affect attitudes and cause all kinds of uh, social unrest. We have seen demonstrations and violence in both of these places. These are absent in Thailand. Uh, what is it that make, uh, that make uh, Thailand immune to fake news? So first question first, right? Okay, yes, the first question is, is there like a system to speak up and report the cases of corruption? There is, but um, I'm not sure if it works efficiently. <laughs> is, it guess, anonymous? Uh, is it anonymous? It's, it's anonymous in the sense that uh, you can write something uh, like a piece of paper and put it on a box but there's a video camera in the back, <laughs> uh, videoing you. <laughs> or you can uh, call, sub, call, call this uh, whatever number, and uh, when you complain about something, and they ask you to declare your ID, ID number. <laughs> so <laughs> what's the point? <laughs> so so is, that route does not work for us, I think. Uh, and and on, uh, on, on the question of um, uh, fake news and uh, uh, the resistance to that in Thailand? <laughs> I, I think that there's fake news everywhere. <laughs> there's fake news in Thailand too. It's, but you said that everyone there washes hands and wears the masks and they do not feel that it is unmanly to wear a mask in public. Oh, in that sense? Uh, I think it's, it's less here because we've been through SARS, we've been through quite a few pandemic before this one. So we are aware of what's going on on that. So fake news on, we, we, fake news does not work that well on this well-being of people. But fake news might work well on political view on something else. <laughs> um, well, I mean, uh, this relates also to the grade that Tunisia, uh, that uh, Thailand uh, gets with respect to the freedom of press. Maybe Susie can tell us something from the media perspective. Uh, um, how does this low grade affect the adequate reporting on what the problem and the response and the guidance goes out and uh, the influence of conspiracy theories and that kind of stuff that uh, may get in the way of a proper response. So I've been really fortunate in that most of my reporting hasn't been internal politics um, and it's been regional. So I've never personally experienced um, any, I've never had any experiences where I've been pressured to not report something, et cetera. Um, but I know plenty of people that have had that experience. Um, and it's a difficult question to answer because it has to be answered in the context of what's gone on in the country in the last 14 years, which is to say that for many of those last 14 years, there has been uh, a non democratically elected government. So it's gone on and off, right? And there have been 
two or three, I can't even remember, coups in that time. And when you are, when you have a political situation like that, it's inevitable that um, the press is going to be one of the first institutions that gets silenced because, you know, you people lose a lot of rights, right? I mean, it's not normal in a democracy for people to have to undergo a curfew because there's been a coup. And this has happened numerous times in the 15 years that, I, that I've been here. Um, whether taking that out of the equation, which is it's very hard to do, I'm not, I can't really answer why press freedom ranks so lowly, but when you add that back into the, the equation, it, it absolutely makes perfect sense that, that's, that that is the way it would be. And if you look at, at the, the evolution of the government over the last 15 years, really starting with the, um, the coup that toppled um, Tax and Shinawat, you do see, and he was no fan of free press either, um, you do see that it, it would, it's an unfortunate um, inevitability. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, we have another question uh, from uh, uh, Serena, and uh, it's about uh, the potential of um, uh, additional waves of uh, cases, infections, and so on. And uh, if that happens and we have new waves coming, do you think that uh, it will be handled the same way or differently by the uh, Thai authorities? Oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> um, I think that uh, if it comes back again, I, I hope it's not coming back again. I don't think that we will go back to the extreme of closing down the shopping centers like that. Uh, I hope that uh, we, uh, if the, if coming back to the three pillars, if we, if one of us show that we have enough discipline to live our life daily in social distancing. And uh, the second uh, pillar is uh, social sanction. Everyone uh, is uh, make sure that this is an important thing. Then the government doesn't have to do that much of the same thing that they used to do. So if we can prove that the, two, the top two pillars works, we, we don't need the government to to, to, to launch anything stringent on us. Susie, any thoughts? Um, I think right now, given that the country is totally closed off um, and there seem to be relatively low numbers of local infections and anybody who comes into the country is quarantined, it seems like a, a resurgence would be easy to control under those circumstances. But the issue is if we start to change those circumstances or if we say, you know, Thailand says, okay, hey, like look at these six different countries that have very low rates as well. Let's open the borders up to those. Well, each one of those steps obviously creates more, more and more risk. I think the good thing for Thailand is that they know that the, the measures that they took were effective the first time. So I would expect that they would be able to, um, to hone that approach but to act pretty quickly. I mean, we saw a similar thing happen in Chile, I don't know, a few weeks ago, right? Where they saw their numbers going down and this is a country with less than 20 million people. They saw the numbers going down, they started to, to let people go back to normal life. And then two and a half weeks later, they were having two and 3,000 new cases a day and went into a lockdown that was even more, more severe and dramatic. Um, hopefully that wouldn't happen in Thailand, but you know, these are, these are questions that probably none of us are, can really answer at this point. Um, I, I mean, at this point, I wanted to ask, I, I was contacted by the Supreme Audit Office in Thailand that uh, there would be some participation from their uh, uh, institution. Do we have someone from there who can tell us what measures they are taking to deal with the potential of fraud, waste, mismanagement, and corruption in uh, the country? Mm. 
No, uh, I do not uh, hear them. Maybe uh, if they came in, uh, they, they had to leave uh, earlier. Um, um, uh, Paul, um, uh, would you like to make your point after the discussion that we had on the balance between economy and health? Paul Jensen? Yes, certainly when, when it's convenient for you, if it's convenient, because it's go not- ahead, Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I've, I've been, you know, very few people will actually speak to this point, um, but I know, I know the narrative goes on because I have sadly personally heard it. And not only with regard to uh, COVID-19, uh, but the idea that if older people die, and I am older, I'm 72 almost, uh, or if poor people die, uh, we're simply thinning the herd. And the, the virus, you know, in many places in the US tends to strike lower income people. It strikes older people, people in nursing homes, etc. And the argument is, uh, it lowers social security cost. You know, the low cost fanaticism. Uh, you know, cost cut, you know, being the justification for everything in business schools. It's nonsense. It's been nonsense since Justinian was emperor of Rome. But, you know, it's a narrative that plays today. We heard it with Boeing, the 737 MAX 8 catastrophe, uh, which had nothing to do with the virus. So um, I think that is also an issue that needs to be brought to the front. It needs to be called out. Uh, and because there, there is a school of thought, not in Thailand that I've heard. And I totally agree with the welfare concept that has been expressed. That, you know, if, if underprivileged people die off, well, the cost of social security goes down. And if your only concept is, or only criteria is cost, that's not wrong. Well, uh Thank you, thank you, Paul. Uh, uh, there are multiple ways of thinking about this. Uh, uh, one is that yes, in, in some parts of the world, we have seen a far higher rate of older people getting uh, affected and uh, seriously affected or dying. But we have seen uh, intriguing examples where very young people uh, are also affected and they have secondary uh, organ failures and problems and we've had deaths and, and this is being investigated. Uh, so it possibly we have also different strains of the virus that have different effects and this is why the death rates and the impact in Italy or in New York are much higher than in other places. Um, there are still studies on this, but there's another point that I would like to raise, and that has to do with uh, the low income, informal workers, migrant workers, and so on. We often fail to realize how critical they are to the economy. We wouldn't have food on the table if it wasn't for them. 20 or more percent of uh, uh, the people working in uh, the agriculture uh, industry and hospitality, I mean, people who drive and bring the packages to you and so on, are in this category. So if these people are affected, the supply chain and the economy and the food security, with all kinds of consequences, will be affected. So I would argue very strongly against any idea that, A, we can have herd immunity, uh, even if uh, 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 some are thinking that they may getting close to that. Even Sweden isn't getting anywhere near it. Um, uh, so uh, I think that from both a public health uh, perspective as well as economic one, we should not underestimate the importance of uh, uh, all kinds of critical workers without whom neither the economy nor the society will be able to function. And in this respect, there is also the question to you. I, I haven't seen um, any, any item to suggest that informal, therefore unregistered workers, uh, how do they get any support from the government? They are also getting unemployed or they're getting left out and they do not have health coverage. Is there any mechanism in Thailand to actually get some money to them or give them some way of dealing with this? Or are they on their own? Uh, 
Um, yeah. there, there are a couple things, um, and it doesn't cover everybody, but one, with respect to migrant workers, of which there are, are many in this country, migrant workers who are registered migrant workers, and, and it's not that onerous to become a registered migrant worker, have had access to the healthcare system for quite a while and do have some access to some of the um, ad hoc relief measures that have happened. And, and there has been quite an effort, actually, though not perfect, to cover all of the informal workers um, in the, especially in the services sector in Thailand. So um, it's not, it's not perfect and there are definitely people that are falling through the cracks, but there are, are measures that are, again, ad hoc measures that are in place to at least offer some limited ben benefits to these different groups of people. I have a whole spreadsheet of this. I can share it with you later on and you can see what the different you know, mechanisms are, but there are some, and there is an acknowledgement that this is an, you know, important part of the economy and humanity that needs to, to have some kind of protections. Did you have any thoughts, uh, Colin? No, um, I think no. that uh, Susie's point was uh, clear enough. Okay, so uh, I think uh, uh, this is where we uh, can actually draw to a close because we have gone way beyond uh, our uh, uh, scheduled uh, time. Uh, thank you very much for your participation, for your contributions. Thank you, Colin and Susie. Uh, thank you, Serena and uh, uh, Yelena for all, and our students that I thanked at the beginning for doing this. If anyone would like to see the case study that uh, uh, we have prepared for your comments. Uh, uh, please uh, send an email to me or to uh, uh, Yelena and we'll get it to you so that you can take a look, and give us your feedback. We look forward to having you in our next webinar on Brazil, which I suspect is going to be a little more lively uh, given the uh, kinds of issues that have come up and it's a bigger country and a bigger economy. So uh, please join us and let's compare Thailand with Brazil uh, next Tuesday when we get back together. Uh, Yelena, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much, Nikos, Karlin, and Susie for your wonderful presentations. Uh, huge thank you goes to all the students who did their due diligence work on this country report. And thank you, Thailand leadership team, for your continuous support. Uh, um, and thank you so much, everyone, for your participations. Please, please feel free to reach out to me um, via email um, or just leave a comment in, your, in the chat box and I'll reach out back to you. Um, and while if you wanted to see the recorded uh, of this program, just uh, again, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to share that with you. And uh, I'll hope to see you um, next week. Thank you, everybody. All right. Have a good night in Bangkok. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Nikos? Yep. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.